Well, it's a little after one. We'll go ahead and get started now. Um, good afternoon. I'll try that again. Good afternoon, everyone. Ah, that's better. Uh, I'm Matthew York from the Hydraulics Unit, and I will be moderating for this session. Uh, welcome to session four for day two of the pre-construction workshop. As a reminder, please continue to comply with NC State's face covering policy. Uh, now, please join me in welcoming our state traffic engineer, uh, Kevin Lacey. Terry, uh, it's not too late to leave since you know so I'm going to be presenting. <clears throat> Actually, uh, I'm glad to be able to talk to you guys today about something that this might be the only session uh, that PDN's not talked about. Not that I'm a, opposed to PDN, because I think it's a very valuable tool. But uh, this is talking about some of the you know, future things uh, that will be coming to our roads. And uh, when we get a chance to ask questions, somebody needs to ask the question uh, from a design standpoint, what can I be doing today to be preparing for these vehicles tomorrow? So let me start going through this. Got a few items today. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the activities in North Carolina, you know, from a legal standpoint, as well as some of the actual act active activities and things that we've done. We also will talk about some pilot projects that we've actually carried out. And then, you know, we'll talk about some of the lessons learned from those deployments. <clears throat> Planning for the future. This is always a good topic. Uh, infrastructure and data you know what do we need to do with our infrastructure and if we think we've had big data in the past uh, we have no data compared to what we will be seeing in the future when we start talking about what these machines will be able to create partnerships and equity policies and legislation and uh, innovative marketplace good old shared mobility this is going to be uh, the transportation future, I mean, we, we talk about uh, autonomous vehicles when trucks and, and other de delivery devices and cars, but when we start talking about, you know, all of the different areas where autonomy is going to affect our, our, our uh, mobility, it's, it's much broader than just cars and trucks. And that's going to, uh, again, just make the, the world even more exciting. Everyone's seen the... Uh, you know, usually when we talk about CAV, you know, it's always the electrification as well. Uh, the, it's not a requirement for an uh, autonomous vehicle or connected vehicle to be uh, electric, but, you know, most of the folks who are working in that space are, are very green-minded, and a lot of their vehicles are either tailored towards that uh, or, you know, they plan to do so anyway. So, you, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go in on the different types of, of electric vehicles or, or really a whole bunch about, you know, too much of the nomenclature. If you're not familiar with all the nomenclature at this time, you know, connected vehicles is connected, talking to pretty much everything else, everybody else, talking to the roadway, talking to other cars, uh, you know, talking to home, and hopefully even, uh, uh, you know, other, uh, you know, users of the roadway that may not have, you know, large battery packs packed on their back like bicyclists and pedestrians, you know, all brought to us by another piece of technology that, you know, many of us when we started our careers didn't, uh, didn't have that. Well, at least some of us, there's, there's some gray hairs out there. Again, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of policy conversations about connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles. You know, are we going to push information out? And if so, what information are we going to push? You know, I, my opinion on a lot of the stuff is, is that we're going to be a small data provider in the big stream. You know, uh, when you start looking at, uh, you know, we being the DOT agencies, we're going to be a consumer of information and a pusher of information, but we're also probably going to be pushing a whole lot less than we're consuming. You know, we'll know what's going on in our roadway, but will we know who's on our roadway, where they're at, where they're going, and, you know, are we even going to be illegally allowed to have that? Scalable deployments, that's another thing that's good about uh, connected vehicles and the connected technology is, is that it doesn't have to be everywhere. 
I made a presentation a few years ago and said that, you know, if we could connect the entire system for, I don't know, a thousand dollars a mile, yeah, it would take hundreds of billions of dollars to connect our system across the entire country. And what, it, what can you do for a thousand dollars a mile on a highway? Nothing, drive it, look at it, maybe. So, uh, so, so just think about that scale. So when we start thinking about connected, it's gonna be focused on things that really need to be uh, additional conversation. And of course, planning for the, for the next wave of, of the self-driving vehicles, are they really gonna, are they gonna trust the data that somebody else sends them? Has anybody talked to uh, people working in this space? So far, everyone I've talked to said, probably not. What we're gonna do is use that data to verify what we already know and sense. We will use it to help supplement things that we may not be able to sense. But, uh, but you know, think about that. Are you gonna be a multi-billion dollar company putting the future of your brand and technology on some third party uh, information that you think was verified, probably not. We don't do it today unless you uh, just, you know, are inundated with social media and believe everything you see on that. But Autonomous vehicles, uh, there used to be five levels and we got really innovative and created level zero. Uh, level zero was everything up until level one, you know. Uh, I, I tell you, engineers were great on stuff, but but uh, it, we're we're at the level three or or level two today. That's what you're going to buy on the road out there today. I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, you know the uh, autopilot and stuff like that, but but all that really is just level two. The marketing sounds a whole lot better than than the world, but uh, and and anybody who's gotten into this conversation too much, is scared to death of level three. And if you're not scared of level three, you should be. Uh, level three is, you know, you set, you, it drives sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't drive. Anybody see the commercial where the family is uh, in the back and, and they're popping popcorn and dad jumps back there to watch the movie, you know, uh, in the RV? Well, you know, that, that that's, you know, would be like a level four, level five, but level three says, you know, I need you to take over control of the car. And uh, human drivers are easy and willing to check out of that driving task so fast. And it's very difficult to pick back up that driving task on that immediate notice. So a lot of folks in the industry think that we're going to hopefully skip level three and, uh, and go straight to level four. Again, uh, uh, a lot of pilots in, in, in versus deployments. You know, there's a lot of pilots out there today. Uh, all the policies and operations and decisions, we like to think they have been made. They haven't. It's only been, the surface has only been scratched. Uh, our state laws, I assure you, we have some pretty good state laws that permit this, but I also assure you they will be changed. That's the level three, four, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the wrong slide when I'm talking, so you, uh, I'm not gonna go over that again. So this is always the question. You know, there's several questions that comes to self-driving vehicles. When will they be here? And the answer has been soon for, I don't know, uh, forever. And, uh, uh, and will they increase the uh, vehicle miles traveled on the highway? You know, I always get the question, uh, will they increase or decrease VMT? And my answer is yes. It will increase and decrease VMT, but when will they be here? I think it's sooner than what many people are saying. Uh, you know, the, the question of when is always, uh, uh, what do you mean by when? When can you go buy one? When can you uh, register to ride in one? When, you know, what 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 does when mean? Because... You know, today, you can already get in a self-driving vehicle, uh, depending on where you are. You can order up a self-driving lift in Las Vegas. You can get on some self-driving 
uh, uh, vehicles in California with Waymo and Arizona and others. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, they're available today. They're just not widely available in the marketplace. California has eight different companies that have approved self-driving testing. Uh, about six weeks ago, that was just two companies. Maybe a little bit longer than six weeks, but it was right before the, uh, the end of the year. Uh, the deputy director of DMV in California told me they just approved their second one. So now they have eight. Uh, you, you, you look at, they're, they're, they're actually, they got 65 companies that have been approved to test the technology across their state. They got two that have driverless deployments. And when you start looking at, uh, you know, what kind of experience do they have and, and so forth, it's, it's growing quite, quite rapidly. And when we start talking about some of the uh, driving hours and miles in a minute, I think some of these numbers will, 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 will be kind of surprising when you start thinking about comparing it to your personal driving experience. In North Carolina, you know, I, I will say it, uh, we're open for business. We are ready for any self-driving technology to come to our state. We have very good laws that permit it. Uh, we have, <clears throat> uh, in fact, we have laws that permit almost any autonomy. Uh, not only uh, uh, cars and trucks and robots and and other things that we'll talk about, but but you can see here, this is the uh, timeline that, that we have, uh, have uh, passed laws. Uh, everything from allowing them to, to uh, platooning to uh, some of these guys, these little personal delivery devices, you know, PDD, not PDN. But uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, these things are allowed on our, on our sidewalks and so forth. Uh, they're currently required to be monitored, uh, but you know it. It is uh, they're available and they're out there. Anybody uh, familiar with the A A and T uh, process? They have robots that's delivering food at, at North Carolina A and T. You'll see this as another uh, plenty of other campuses around the country that that have these little devices delivering. Our laws for those are, were, uh, and, I, and I'm not going to read all these, but if, if you really want to get into it, uh, it's 20-175.15 uh, personal delivery devices. We have, you know, our law requires them, if you're in a pedestrian space, you got to act in a pedestrian mode. So you can't do 25, 30 miles an hour down the sidewalk. Uh, and if you're on the shoulder of the roadway, uh, you need to be operating as if you're you know, a bicycle or something of that nature. I think those are part of the things of, of, of having everybody else say, well, what, what do I do? What do I, what am I supposed to do when one of these things come? You know, if you're on a sidewalk, you know, don't jump in front of it. It's not going to run you over. It'll stop. But, uh, you know, it, it uh, you know, it's, it's going to get, you know, try to go around you and all those type things. Uh, if it was acting like a pedestrian on the shoulder, walking in the opposite direction, can you imagine going down the highway at 35, 40 miles an hour in this little cooler with a little orange flag, <laughs> probably with Clemson on the back of it, coming at you at 35 miles an hour as well, you know? You know, that's probably uh, would be unnerving. So that's why we said, you know, follow the rules of the road. The... Uh, Another state law that we have, this is a, a new one, is the zero occupant vehicles. This is a, uh, this is a, a new law that passed this year. Anybody seen the uh, Domino's pizza commercial with the Neuro? That's the whole purpose of, of that Neuro device. It's too big to operate on the sidewalks, but it's not quite a motor vehicle. And if it, you know, it, it's never intended to haul a person. My guess is that there'll be some college kid crammed in there one day but, uh, and, and delivered somewhere, but, but that's not what the intent of, of, that, of that vehicle is. So, and some of you guys will probably be the ones cramming them in there, but, but, but the intent of it is, is to deliver groceries, deliver hot pizza, 
cold beer and other necessities, you know, of life. So, uh, so th- this thing <clears throat> is, you know, they they came up with a whole new name of of what it was. It was a neighborhood occupantless vehicle. It really is a low speed vehicle in in design. It is intended to be low speed. Uh, part of the issue with the uh, uh, you know when when you when you start working in these spaces. Uh, you know, you, you start learning how to do uh, uh, what I call uh, general statutes and policy calisthenics. How, you know, it's, it's almost gymnastics. You know, how can you make these things fit into a law because you need to have it working on our roadway or in the system soon? And quite frankly, you know, uh, we should be hoping to move this stuff forward. I've been a huge fan of moving the uh, self-driving technology forward for two purposes. Safety. Last year, we had more people die in our system than we had since 1973. And Lord knows we didn't want to, you know, going up to 1973 would have been a whole other magnitude of, of, of deaths. But, but that, we're way too high. One is too many. And this is an t- opportunity that that we see that can uh, reduce a lot of those injuries and fatalities. It's not going to be the silver bullet, but but it will be a huge benefit because you all drive as much as anybody else, and you see everybody on the road trying to do something other than drive that vehicle. They're reading something, they're texting, you know, whatever they're doing when their attention should be driving that car. And if you're one of those people, shame on you. I'll call you out if I see you doing it. Won't run you off the road. I'll call you out in a meeting like this. Uh, but the uh, the other issue is is that we got a lot of people who are underserved. You know, uh, when we put our first uh, fully autonomous vehicle uh, roadmap together, we had a, a work group, and there was a a lady. Uh, I'm not sure how old she was, but she was blind. I don't know if she's been blind her entire life. But she's already wrote the check. She's ready to write the check, buy that vehicle today, because she doesn't want to depend on somebody else to go to the grocery store, to go somewhere else. But just think of all the other folks who uh, don't have the ability to drive themselves, that this technology will help. You know, uh, we're, we we all hope to be great-great-grandparents one day, and... and uh, uh, and the day that we have to give up the keys, you know, doesn't necessarily mean it's a death sentence. And when you talk to older folks, they don't want to give up the keys because they see that as the beginning of the end of their life. Just think if you're not giving up your mobility, all you're doing is changing it in a different mode, the quality of life, uh, the excitement of the future when you're older. Rules of the road. This is one of the items that... Uh, I've been asking a number of the developers, and and generally they are developing based on the rules of the road of the state that they're in. And uh, that should be scary for many of us because a lot of them are in Pittsburgh. Anybody ever to the Pittsburgh left? Yeah, not many. Uh, The Pittsburgh left taking place in North Carolina is going to get somebody hurt. Pittsburgh left is, is that regardless of what the signal says that first car making a left turn goes. Uh, that doesn't work here. It doesn't work in most places. But uh, but that's just their tradition up there. And uh, so if you're driving in Pittsburgh and have to be in the through movement and there's a left-turning car in the turn lane ahead of you, uh, don't be surprised if they go. So that's why all the Pittsburgh drivers down here drive like crazy. But uh, but 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 anyway, what rules are they using? Because every state has different nuances in their laws. You know, I, I, I bring up one of the more basic traffic signal rules. You know, uh, you know, what are you required to do when the light turns yellow? Yeah. <laughs> speed up. Speed up. You know, well, most states, it, you know, you can legally clear the intersection as long as you've entered the intersection on yellow. But there's four states that require you to clear the intersection on the onset of the red. You know, uh, and if you've not cleared that intersection on the onset of the red, then you have run a red light. You know, 
There's only four of those states, and I've given their state traffic engineers a hard time about complying with the normal folks. But, you know, their legislature has to change that. Most of them are in the Northeast. I know that surprises many of us, but uh, Rhode Island's one of them. You know, Peter Griffin up there driving around. But uh, that's just one of the most basic, one of the most basic rules of the road is traffic signals. And we don't have complete concurrence in our country on that. And how long is it going to take us to get all of our rules of road aligned? Anybody guess? I'll ask another simple question. Uh, how long do you think it took to get the same color yellow for school buses? Anybody know? The people who work in that area are not allowed to answer. 70 years to get all 50 states to agree to the same color school bus. Just took 70 years just to come up with the common color. So just think how difficult it's going to be on the other stuff. So how does this work? You know, how does this technology work? There's all kinds of stuff inside those cars. Uh, LIDAR, radar, you know, infrared, uh, you name it, it's in there in most vehicles. Uh, but every one of them, yeah, they got different ways that they're coming up with their solutions. Uh, some of them are using driving experience. Many of them, they got many, many miles. And this is what I was talking about here. This is just one company, Waymo, has 20 million miles of self-driving experience. 15 plus billion miles of simulated experience. Now, how many of you think you got a million miles of driving in your life lifetime? Any long haul truckers here? You know, there's, there's people who do get into the multi-million miles of driving, and they're usually long-haul truckers. But you and I and the other 99% of the people on the roadway, you know, to get to a million miles in our driving life is, is, is quite a feat. And this machine has 20 million of those. And then when you start talking about, well, how do I get into all these other scenarios? And they're using simulations. And there's one company... Uh, uh, up in, in Pittsburgh that's using uh, technology that, that far exceeds Hollywood's level of, of, of uh, simulation. They're showing it to us, and what they do is, is you know, and, and they will drive, you know, overnight they'll drive many, 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 many miles running that system through just about as many endless scenarios as they possibly can think. Just think if we held that, held you to that standard in order to get your driver's license. None of us would have driver's license. We would be counting on somebody else to drive us, you know, but, uh, so, so when we start thinking about, you know, what's going on on this road what's going on in this field, uh, driving is a very complicated task. We all take it for, for granted. Uh, but when you start trying to tell a machine, a computer, how to do it with everything else going on around you, all the different soft targets, hard targets, stuff flying out of the air. Who knows what's going on? Uh, what are you supposed to do? We're counting on you to make that decision. And we, you know, quite freely give, uh, uh, I don't know, many hundred thousands of 16-year-olds a driver's license every year. They got, you know, maybe they got 10 hours of supervised driving. Uh, this is one thing that's got, you know, 15 billion miles of simulated driving. And even the best teenager is not going to get that much simulation time on their Atari or PS2 or whatever else they have today. PS5, I think, is out there. Yeah, Atari, uh, uh, he's an old man up there, isn't he? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Tipping the scales. This is, uh, th th this is one I think is real exciting. I always talk about, I, I told the Board of uh, Transportation a few months ago that, uh, you know, Tesla's got uh, But they also have lawyers. You know, if you read a Tesla article, a Tesla, something put out by Tesla, you think that thing's going to drive you to the market today drive around the block while you go in there and pick up your eggs and bread because it's going to snow this weekend, and, uh, and then come out and you hop in and drive home. Uh, somewhere, if you buy a Tesla, you're signing something saying that this is not a self-driving vehicle. It's a level two. In fact, 
a level, you know, a level four and five doesn't exist today. That's in the, that's in all of their legal stuff that you will sign and, and, and purchase. Uh, so uh, there, there's kind of two tracks of development. You got most everybody else that's following that, you know, I'm going to say thoughtful develop process, which is laborious and slow. That's why it takes so long for new models to come to the market and so forth. And then you got Tesla who's pushing that stuff out there. You know, kind of like the uh, video game development. You know, uh, personally, I think uh, uh, there's some good things about that. There's also some scary things. But, what you know, we need somebody out there to push this technology forward. Because if we wait for the most cautious person in the world to, to do this, we'll never do it. And we'll continue to kill, you know, 25, 35, 40,000 people a year on our highways. So we need... We need that moxie, and we need that challenge. We need people to challenge the industry. So when we start talking about, you know, that nice little Tesla car riding down the highway, uh, what about when we start putting 80,000 pounds of whatever on a truck? You know, we're ready for maybe a few thousand pound cars to get out there. How about 80,000 pound trucks? Uh, we should be because this is probably one of the areas that's going to get a lot of attention in the very near future. Anybody heard about driver shortage? You know, if you've not heard about driver shortage, then, you know, I don't know where you've been hiding. It's been an issue for, for quite some time now. Uh, it's, it's long before, long before the, uh, 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 the pandemic. Drivers, you know, this, this is not a, a popular field for people to go into. Uh, you know, who wants to be away from home? you know, 40 weeks out of the year, you know, pretty much the Navy and long haul truck drivers, right? But, uh, but, but anyway, this is an area where uh, Volvo already has large trucks driving out of an open pit. They're driving from the bottom of a pit. And they, I don't know how deep it is, but it's deep when they're open pit mining and they're driving on those roads that don't have guardrail to keep them on it. And they're driving up and they're going back and forth where the, the potential for error is is that you fall over the cliff into the hole. And they're not doing that. So uh, I believe the technology is here quicker. It will be here quicker than we, uh, the, the biggest concerns in, in my mind is, is, is government going to regulate it and slow it down? You know, it, it, will the federal government do that? Will the state government do that? Uh, I think the uh, conversation of, of public acceptance is real. Are we willing to do this? Are we willing to, you know, hop in these cars and, and, and let something else drive? I think it, once it starts, it's going to go real fast. But when we start thinking about all of the opportunities out there, even with connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles, there's plenty of places that we have uh, opportunities to take advantage of it in, uh, on the infrastructure side. Uh, and, uh, and as the, you know, the technology continues to develop, uh, this is where I will beat up on uh, Federal Highways, uh, USDOT, AASHTO, uh, we really need someone to make a command decision about the technology of connecting these vehicles. To me, this is, uh, it's a shame that, you know, the argument of, of 5G versus DSRC, uh, when, when the Federal Communications set aside that bandwidth 20 years ago, 3G was just coming out. Uh, how many people have died on our highways since in, in the last 20 plus years? Uh, Somebody, the federal communications folks showed the, uh, the transportation folks on how to make a decision. 20 years ago, they made a decision. Here it is. It's a great idea. Go forth and make it happen. 20-some years later, well, actually nothing's happened. We got other people who want that. We're going to divide it up and give it to somebody else. Please go make something happen. Make a, make a decision so the industry knows which direction to go. Uh, and, uh, and AASHTO is just as much in the, the fault there, too, because AASHTO can push that. It's 50 states. If 50 states says we want to go DSRC, then, you know, that can help. 
Question about more cars. This has come from a planning standpoint. We got some research that we're working on uh, about whether it's going to increase VMTs, what is it going to do. Uh, this is always a good question. This is my opinion. I think it uh, depends upon the cost of ownership. And uh, because we as a group of people, we value convenience tremendously. Uh, if the uh, ownership cost is about what a car costs today, you know, say the, the Model 3 is, the, uh, is in that range, let's say fifty dollars to $60,000, $70,000 for the full driving technology, I think every one of us will probably tr still want to own, those who can afford a car will own, own at least one. Uh, if it's a much higher cost, you know, let's say it gets up into that hundred plus thousand dollar range. I mean, you know, there'll be a few of you that still own one car. There'll be some that may own two. Uh, but I think you'll see some, uh, you know, maybe some co-ops where there'll be multiple people who, you know, buy into a, you know, a service or, or, uh, or, or maybe a, a neighborhood, you know, uh, through a co-op of that. Uh, and then, if it's a very high cost of ownership, you know, let's say that thing is a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, to buy, own, and operate, then I think you'll see mostly corporate ownership. There'll still be a few people out there, you know, uh, that, that will own one that that will have it. But but when you start looking at the corporate ownership, then uh, what's good about the corporate ownership is is that you know that does solve one of the questions about. Uh, electric vehicles taking up gas tax, because if the vast majority of the travel is done by corporate ownership, then guess what? We just do a VMT tax and move on. We just ask Ford to send us a, a check, and we don't care who's in the car, and they're not even going to tell us that they picked you up at the, uh, you know, the casino and carried you somewhere else. You know, that, that, that's your own personal business. But, uh, you know, that, that's part of that concern about the VMT is, is privacy. But a corporate ownership... You know, it's pretty much like we collect tax from uh, trucking companies. We don't care what they're hauling, and, you know, we do, but we're not taxing them too much different uh, uh, because they, uh, you know, they're buying diesel fuel, and, and whether they're hauling uh, corn or, or uh, well, corn may not be a good example, whether they're hauling cars or, or they're hauling steel, they're paying the same amount for diesel fuel. We've got a lot of partnerships around the state. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of these, but uh, I will tell you uh, everything from the research side to the implementation side. Uh, it is uh, uh, a lot of work going on in this area. It's very exciting. Um, uh, I, I was telling Terry and others uh, about uh, where we are. Anybody ever heard of the uh, uh, um, the hype curve? Anybody heard of the hype curve? Hype curve for all you engineers, it goes up and then it comes way down, then it swings back up. The hype curve is when you get all these newspaper articles and everything. Everybody's excited about how great things will be, and you know that was like three, four, five years ago. You couldn't open a, a publication uh, that didn't have something about you know self-driving vehicles and 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 how the world was going to change. I think we're in the trough of disillusionment now, and because uh, it didn't hear yet. You know, we just haven't been able to buy it yet. What's really encouraging about the trough of disillusionment is, is that the slope of enlightenment is next. And I, and that come, I think that's, that's where we're getting. I think we're going to see real progress in the next, uh, five years. I think you'll see, uh, market ready devices that either trucking companies will have on the road, transit agencies will have, uh, if not, uh, uh, you know, small communities and other people being able to purchase these things and, and really solve transportation uh, and bring this solution forward. So that's the uh, rest of my conversation, and I'm going to turn it over back to Matt to introduce. Well, uh, Sarah is going to come up and say a few things, and, and then she's going to enter introduce Amanda, and I was giving Amanda a hard time because it was just uh, just me and Amanda, and I was going to give you guys a challenge. Between me and Amanda, one of us recently ran and completed a, a marathon, and the other one stayed home and got fat. You guys got to figure out who was who. <laughs> All right.
Thank you, Kevin. Um, hi, everyone. This is the largest group I've been in front of probably in two years. So it's great to see you all. My name is Sarah Searcy. I'm the new Deputy Director for Innovations and Data within NCDOT's Integrated Mobility Division. And I just wanted to take a few minutes to talk about the Integrated Mobility Division and how we support innovation in the state before handing the presentation off to Amanda. And she's going to share some information about Cassie, our AV pilot in North Carolina. So NCDOT recognizes that the landscape of mobility is changing as we, as a society, reimagine traditional modes and devise new ways of moving from one place to another, such as through autonomous vehicles. We react to a growing need and desire from the public to provide multimodal transportation options and to embrace new technologies by leading research and exploring innovations that can make transportation safer and more convenient, particularly for those who rely on modes other than driving. Our commitment to meet the need for multimodal transportation options is reflected in the mission of the Integrated Mobility Division. Our division was formed in 2019 when we merged the Bicycle and Pedestrian and Public Transportation Divisions. A central reason for the merger was to ensure that we are working towards common goals and strategies across modes and to position ourselves to react to emerging mobility needs and technologies. We also merged to strengthen partnerships between planning organizations, our division, and public transportation agencies, and also to better integrate and regionalize multimodal transportation concepts throughout North Carolina. Our mission and vision emphasize innovation to achieve our goals. We envision a future where local and regional multimodal transportation options rival driving in terms of time, convenience, and cost, all transportation network users are accommodated safely. Technology, innovation, and partnerships enable rapid progress in safety and quality of transportation services. Land use and transportation planning are intertwined. And residents are happier, healthier, and more likely to participate and succeed in the economy. As you can imagine, to achieve this vision, we have several goals. We want to eliminate transportation barriers and ensure all North Carolinians have equal access to opportunities and services. We want to offer a convenient network of multimodal choices to enhance the quality of life for North Carolinians. And we want to ensure all road users can travel safely by building complete streets and proactively correcting areas susceptible to crashes involving vulnerable road users, including bicyclists and pedestrians. And if you are interested in learning more about complete streets in North Carolina, please stay in this room, room six, for the presentation that follows ours from 2.30 to 3.30. Innovation is central to meeting our goals, so we have embraced a common innovation process that has led to several pilots and opportunities since 2019. Our process focuses on understanding emerging mobility trends, developing ideas around new and emerging technologies, securing grant funding, piloting new concepts, using lessons learned to shape policy, and publicizing best practices broadly. The Connected Autonomous Shuttle Supporting Innovation, or CASI, is an example of this process. The CASI pilot has been useful to further our understanding of AV shuttle technology, helping us plan for the future of transportation and explore how AV technology will help us achieve our division's core goals. Now I'll hand the presentation off to Amanda Good. She's going to share our experiences with CASI, including lessons learned and best practices from three deployments that were completed in 2020 and 2021. So one cool tidbit about the Cassie is that um, we were able to actually deploy on a national park site, which was first, because if anybody has heard, Yellowstone had two shuttles, but we beat them by about a month. So great for us. Why this project? So what are some of the important things of deploying Cassie? Well, one, it's a pilot. It's trying to learn about autonomous technology, trying to then have a peer-to-peer -peer exchange with other DOTs. There are local and state DOTs who have the, these deployments, and having our deployment 
provides an opportunity for us to share all of the lessons learned and things that we would want to consider for our next deployment. Also, we want to see how safe these shuttles are. Again, they're pilots. We don't really know everything about them. So we're also looking to see if they are, if they are a good first mile, last mile option. Are they a good option for those with limited mobility? How do they interact with pedestrians and vehicles? We wanted to learn. We wanted to figure that out. We wanted to see, are the pavement markings good? Do we need some where there aren't any? Do we need to change uh, crossings, ped crossings, ped tables, speed bumps? Do we have these devices at the signals to be able to communicate to the shuttle? These are all different things that we wanted to learn through these pilots. Also, we wanted to look at different use cases. Where in the state can we deploy the CASI to get into different environments, different communities, different uh, nuances that we would learn from, and then also provide an opportunity for our partners to engage in the learning of this technology. They are as interested in learning and collecting all the data as the state was. And also, while we collect all this data and we are deploying this information, by collecting and interacting with the different vendors, we are essentially helping them advance the technology. And then ultimately, all of this plays into whether or not North Carolina's policies and rulemaking is still great, and as Kevin says, it'll probably change. There were five main goals for the CASI project. Really, the first is just preparing for North Carolina and the future of this technology. We wanted to ensure that what we were putting out into the field is going to help with both the safety and mobility of North Carolinians. We also wanted to look long term. How can we plan long term for this technology? What do we need to do from a transportation planning? What do we need to do from a design? What do we need to do from implementation, operations, and maintenance? And then also looking from, again, different multiple use cases from a transit perspective or transportation service. What sort of solutions can we learn from? And then, of course, again, progressing the technology in the industry so we can have a very successful deployment. The shuttle that is Cassie is Easy Mile. That's the vendor. It is an EZ-10 Gen 3. Try to say that three times really fast. Um, it is electric, uh, it is driverless, it does have an accessibility ramp. It is not referred to as an ADA, it's referred to as accessibility due to the uh, dimensions of the ramp and how it's used. It does have a maximum operating speed of 15 miles per hour. Most deployments are typically around eight to 10, sometimes 12. It is a level four, which means that it is mapped, it is fixed, it, once you go off of this route, it now goes into manual mode, so it's no longer considered an autonomous vehicle. And the capacity is six. Each of the six are seated, and they have a seat belt, and then you do have an operator who can stand. As Sarah mentioned, we've had three deployments. Our first one was at the North Carolina Transportation Summit in 2020. It was just about 2,000 feet. We picked up everybody um, right in the loading area, took them into the amphitheater area, and then came back. Those were your two stops. Um, it was only open to the transportation attendees. Our second one was at NC State Centennial Campus. There were three station stops for this route. It was just shy of a mile. Um, it only went to about 10 miles per hour, and during this use case, we were able to see the interactions between vehicles and pedestrian because it was on regular streets. Um, unfortunately, we were only able to have the deployment for three weeks uh, with the first suspension due to a NHTSA uh, suspension and then soon thereafter COVID. Our third one and most recent one was at the Wright Brothers National Memorial. It was just over a mile. It had two stops, one at the visitor center and one just on the other side of the monument. Um, this one did go about 10 to 12 miles per hour. It again was also seeing the interaction between vehicles and pedestrians, more on the pedestrian side. Um, and we'll get into some lessons learned from that. Um, 
this area, it was, also, it was also open to the public, so we had a lot of pedestrians that we had to, that we learned about. So from the lessons learned, um, and I, I'm not going to read this because I'll go into each one, um, but we did have lots of lessons learned from all three. So even though some of them were very short, a couple days to three weeks to 13 weeks, we did learn from each one. For, uh, first and foremost, the technology is very pilot. Uh, it does have lots of nuances. When the shuttle says, hey, we could do emergency stops, they are very sudden, they are very quick, and if you're not holding on, uh, you could fall over, hence why now uh, there are seat belts in the shuttle. Um, the other big thing that we learned was the weather impact, how rain, and it's, you could have small droplets, you could have large droplets, lots of rain, a little bit of rain, um, fog was also another issue. It's just that the sensors um, were, they measured really close to the ground. And so if you had puddles or anything, it picked it up and it made the shuttle kind of slow down because it wasn't entirely sure exactly what was around. So it almost registered it as an obstacle. And then of course the speed, it's very slow. Um, again, at the Wright Brothers, it really got up to 10. Um, but most of the time it was really kind of slow just because of the interactions. Another key piece was the route, selecting the route, because there were a little bit of nuances that you had to consider when you were looking at the route. One, um, looking at how much time that the shuttle was going to be in autonomous mode versus manual mode. So a lot of times going from the storage to the route, you're in manual, so how far is that? And then when you have a lot of interactions, you might have to change from AV to manual mode. So again, how long and how many times? So that was some of the data that we were collecting. Another piece is that if you have a really open area and you're like, oh, this would be great. Yeah, not so much. You need the sensors and the GPS to be able to ping off of something in order for the shuttle to really know that it's still on the route. And so if it was really open, you had to add signs. And these were five by two signs, so they're not small signs. Um, and then, so you had to consider that, but then if you had too many buildings that were really tall, then it interrupted the GPS signal. So you had to figure out kind of that sweet spot between how much and how little. People interaction was a really large lesson learned um, for us. A lot of times people expected these shuttles to operate just like a regular vehicle, and they don't. Um, however, when they got into the shuttle, they learned about the shuttle, they learned about the technology, they were, it piqued their interest, and they were quite supportive of the fact that we were testing it out. From an operations perspective, there's two key points. You have a vendor point, and then you have the operator point. And the operators are essentially the folks who are on the shuttle to operate it when it's in manual mode. So from the vendor side, some of the lessons learned when we wanted a vendor who could communicate really well. We liked it when the vendor would communicate any changes, any updates, and bringing solutions when there were problems. We came across a few problems, and it was really nice when they would come to the table to help us identify what we needed to do, how we could fix it, or how we could mitigate it, and that was very helpful. And then from an operator perspective, it was really nice when they had some experience, whether it was a retired transit driver or a volunteer, just that experience helped make the interactions with the passengers so much better. We got lots of compliments when the operator was really engaged and understanding and able to explain it. So again, from the infrastructure, one of the key points along, and this plays into the route, that if you don't have a sidewalk or curb, uh, it, the uh, accessible ramp could not be deployed. So we would have to put temporary ramps. And so this is a picture of a temporary ramp at the Wright Brothers. And so obviously not a curb. So we had to get one in order to deploy the accessible ramp. The other thing that we found, not only weather impacted, but weeds impacted. So specifically at the National Park Service, 
the route was mapped really close to the edge of the pavement and they had these fast growing weeds and so they had to maintain the grass a lot because if the weeds grew to a certain height, it actually impacted the sensors and made the shuttle go slow. So again, something else to consider. The other big thing, and again, this plays in with the route selection, is storage. These shuttles are large. They are about nine and a half feet tall. So you need a shuttle or a storage location that can house it at least 10 feet. Trying to find a place that is at least 10 feet high is kind of hard, especially when you have to have electrical and you have to have it slightly temperature controlled and locked and secured. So lots of things to, to uh, consider when you're looking at a storage location that's within a thousand feet of the route. One of the big things with the regulatory, because these are pilots, um, you have to get the NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration exemption in order for it to be compliant to be able to be on the roads. So that takes about three months um, if you're lucky. So that was one thing that we had to do is once we had the route, everything was good. We had to push that exemption forward in order for us to be able to deploy at our locations on time. Um, the other thing that we found really early on is that regardless if you're a private or a public road, the regulations is the same. So it didn't really matter if you were university private road or uh, a like a company parking lot, it was all the same. So uh, which actually kind of made it a little easier, um, kind of the same structure. Some of the best practices that we came across was uh, one is the on-site, and I'm not going to read every one of them, I'm just going to choose a few, but the on-site observation initially, that was a, a, a key thing that we learned from a best practice. And what I mean by this is we did a lot of field work. We went out to the field, we looked at the routes, we identified mitigations, modifications, everything and anything. But once the shuttle actually entered into this environment, it changed everything. So the people interaction, you don't actually see all of that until the shuttle is in place. We found that out largely when it was at the National, um, at Wright Brothers National Park Service. We understood that there were lots of pedestrians. We understood one particular area had a lot of crossings because they're coming basically down the main flight path across the street to the monument. We understood this, we, we knew it. We didn't actually really get the impact of what the shuttle could do until we were on site, until the shuttle was in operations. Then we could really see how that impacted. And so we actually had some folks from the National Park Service there when it went into operations. And we had to quickly make some modifications with the programming, just uh, from a safety perspective. The other thing that we found as a best practice is incorporating your first responders, your local police, fire, EMS, because if something happens, who's gonna to respond to it? Um, we needed to have them come on site, which we did. We gave them an hour training, so we took them through the operations of the shuttle, what happens when this happens, what that, when they need to get to them, uh, like inside, what they needed to do. Spelled this all out, gave them pamphlets, everybody was prepared. We also then had an emergency response plan. It was essentially a flow chart. If this happens, then do this. And here's your contacts with phone numbers. And if any of that changed, we updated it and we gave everybody new versions so that um, everybody could have that because we did have to use that a few times. So this is one of the favorite lessons learned from several folks, and this plays into the whole pedestrian thing. So Wright Brothers, around the monument, you can walk. Lots of people go there and take a daily walk. And they don't walk on the sidewalk, they walk in the road. And if you've ever been there, the road is a little bit larger or a little bit wider than your typical road width. So theoretically, you could probably have two vehicles. Um, pass around it. Um, however, due to the issue of the one crossing, we actually narrowed that width down. However, people still wanted to walk in the road around the loop. 
When the shuttle comes up to the pedestrian, comes behind the pedestrian, it takes the pedestrian and thinks of it as an obstacle. So it slows down, doesn't pass, it doesn't stop, it just follows the pedestrian. <laughs> well, one particular pedestrian didn't like that, complained, um, because what we did not, uh, did not really think about, and again, another lesson learned, was that when you are a walker at Wright Brothers, you don't actually have to come in through the main gate. There is an airport adjacent, and there is an access point, and that's where the pedestrians were coming in. And then they would walk and leave. And so we had to come up with another sign that said, if you see the shuttle, please step over so that the shuttle can pass. Um, that's not exactly what it says, but that's pretty much the gist of it. But um, So yeah, and, and the pedestrian was fine. She was happy. She was OK. Um, she still walked. She walked on the road. But she did step over when she saw the shuttle. Um, so that covers the Cassie project. Are there any questions? And this could be for either myself, Sarah, or Kevin. A quick question regarding the resistance of the basically this technology to hacking and sabotage or basically somebody trying to take control of it. Is there any kind of uh, precaution being taken or any technology being developed to prevent that? So we did ask that question when we were talking with EasyMail initially, is did they have any precautions for any sort of hacking? Um, they do take precautions. Um, they did not go into specifications just because of proprietary information, but um, yes, they do take those precautions. So we are looking at other locations. However, those locations have not been finalized. Um, but we are looking um, at a few, and hopefully once we do, we will announce them. Right now, we're going to continue to pilot. Um, the IMD and Ryan, um, I will let you add more to it, but I know there's other projects that the IMD group is looking at and not just doing a pilot with the CASI. Um, this question is for you or Kevin, either one. Um, you had talked about the cost of the, um, the vehicles, the autonomous vehicles, and, um, you know, in that fifty to 60,000 range, and then, you know, as they may uh, transition uh, up, up from there. Um, one of the things I've been really thinking about is, you know, the actually affordability of even fifty and $60,000 vehicles, right, these days, uh, given the uh, the incomes right across the United States and even the incomes here in North Carolina in many areas and what percentage of that market really can be captured and, and how we can kind of see, um, you know, how much, I guess, in, in your terms from safety, right, how much life we can save, you know, given that. Yeah, I think that's a good question. Uh, not only the, you know, affordability conversation, but I think, uh, Based on that affordability is what is the model that uh, the market will bring forth for transportation. You know, uh, if it costs pennies per mile to use a shuttle service, you know, if it was 10 cents a mile to use a self-driving shuttle service to get everywhere you want, the question is, is who's going to own a vehicle? You know, so that's why, you know, I think that price point is is going to have a lot of determination of what the future model of of providing day-to-day -day transportation services now buying a new car today uh yeah I, i'm I, I haven't bought a new car recently but but it, it does look like the uh you know the the low end of a new car is is quite expensive and uh and from what i'm being told about used cars you know, uh, I may want to sell my car, my extra car. If you can talk Gina into it for me, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Any other questions? 
Now, I seeded the question at the beginning, and no one's going to ask that question. All of you fail. What can I do as a designer to be preparing for this technology? Anybody remember that? Go out there and rip up all the PDH, uh, PDH forms. <laughs> Get none. No suit. What I would tell you is, is uh, uh, make sure that your design is straightforward. Make it as simple as you reasonably can. Uh, you know, the, the concepts of innovative designs, most of those are simplifying the decision making for the human driver. Make it simple for the human driver, guess what? It's less complex for the machine driver. So you know, things that, that simplify the movement, reduces and spreads out decisions, um, you know, reducing left turns, I know that's a popular thing, uh, that we all love having that conversation, but, but when we start talking about what these machines will make in decisions, just think about the risk-based conversation that they're going to do. They're going to make right turns, they're going to make through movements, so fewer signal phases. Uh, if you don't get rid of uh, lane continuity problems, I will turn Renee loose on all of you. Uh, do not have uh, inadvertent merging and diverging just because you, know, you, you fail to connect the through movement. Again, things that make driving simple for you, you should be thinking about that when you're doing your designs. Don't make me do extra turns and moves to go from point A to point B. Now you say, well, Kevin, you, you're a fan of the RCI. Exactly. But I'm saying uh, that reduces the complexity because making a left turn is a lot harder than making a right turn and then a U-turn because I'm only dealing with one direction of traffic at a time. So. You know, just think about you know, those type of conflicts. So when you're doing your designs, working through that process, follow the, the KISS principle, keep it as simple as you reasonably can because it helps everybody. And if you're in maintenance, work on your markings. Work, you know, signs are fine. We need good signs because people are still driving. But pavement markings are what these machines are going to be really uh, and when they get on uh, unpaved roads, they're going to be looking at ditches. They're going to be looking at changes. They'll, you know, if Amanda mentioned that the, the height of the grass affected whether or not Cassie can move forward. That's how sensitive this technology is. So they'll be able to see this type of stuff. But, but again, keep it simple and keep good markings. Now you guys all get a, a D minus. <laughs> All right, let's give uh, Kevin, Sarah, and Amanda a round of applause.